Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We are, if you're in Making Connections, an introduction to digital partner services, you are in the right place. Uh, we're super happy for you to join us today. This webinar is hosted by Healthcare Education and Training with our presenter, Frank Strona, and support from Julie Stutler, who is a consultant for HCET, who is a former DIS. Um, my name is Adele White. I'm a project manager at HCET, and I'm going to be your MC for today's webinar. So, Firstly, I'm going to introduce you a little bit to healthcare education and training. So HCET's mission is to provide comprehensive program development, education, and training to improve reproductive and sexual health outcomes. That's our bread and butter. And HCT is an organization of passionate people who are proactive in their belief that access to evidence-based, medically accurate reproductive and sexual health education and training is a fundamental human right. Um, so with that, I'm going to change our slide really quick. You do have access to closed captions here in this webinar if you would like to use them. So if you scroll to the bottom and click on this little CC live transcript, you can then choose show subtitles. And then when you would like to ask a question, we encourage you to Ask questions as you think of them by clicking on the Q&A icon and then just typing your questions into the chat. I will be moderating questions throughout so that I can see what people are asking, compile them, and we will address those at the end. So thank you for your attention and asking questions throughout. I'm just going to review a little bit of housekeeping information so we all know what to do uh, during the webinar. Oh, for Oh, importantly, um, you can follow HCET on many social media platforms you see here, um, Twitter or X as it's called now, the internet, you know, World Wide Web, Facebook, Instagram, things like that. And there will be a link with sent to you after this webinar, most likely tomorrow with an evaluation. We would love your feedback on how we've done today, just so we can improve our webinars in the future and to hear what you think. The recorded version of this webinar will be available on our website, hcet.org, as are all of our archived webinars. So you can check that out there. And if you have any te technical difficulties during this, please email Jen, who's on here helping us with our tech. Thank you, Jen, at updates at hcet.org. I am now going to introduce our, our first presenter for today. So Frank Strona uh, is located in San Francisco. He works for the CDC. He's worked for the CDC for the last 19 years. He's got his master's of public health from the San Jose State University, and he's almost done with his PhD, already sex, uh, successfully defended it, and is just working on his publications. His formal title is a public health advisor for the Centers of Disease Control. So he's with the big guys, uh, CDC, in the Division of STD Prevention and Disease Intervention and Response. So he works on a community level. He works with local and state health departments to really help them bridge their efforts with current technologies to do what you all want to do, which is, you know, help people treat and prevent STIs. Um, he works with a lot of DIS, local health departments. He is a nationally renowned uh, specialist in content themes like diversity, inclusion, gay, bisexual, and non-binary individuals, LGBTQ+, and commercial and adult sex venues, and HIV and STD field intervention techniques. Um, and he does a lot of work on internet and new media interventions and distance-based learning. So he comes to us with a lot of experience. We're super grateful to have him here today. Um, and then we have who've, who's helped us shape this project is Julie Stutler. There she is. Um, love that picture, Julie. And she is a former DIS. She was a DIS, DIS for six years, um, has her master's in epidemiology from the University of Iowa. And she worked at, as a DIS program coordinator uh, for six years. She loves to um, work in the STI fields and just make sure people have the healthiest chance uh, at, you know, prevention and treatment and supporting DIS and the important work that they do. So I will now be turning things over to Frank. Thank you. And thanks for asking me it's again to uh, participate today. 
you know, I, I think the big thing I'm going to be, I have a bunch of slides. We'll make sure there's a PDF available within a few days that we can share out. Uh, a big piece of this is the work that I do with understanding new technology, uh, the UTAP's work group. And uh, I work with an associated team of interdisciplinary folks uh, with health departments who are really thinking about how do we leverage new technologies in order to, um, there you go, in order to um, leverage these tools. I mean, and, and, you know, maybe you're not ready to jump in the ship, but when your community, when your health commissioners are asking, well, what are you doing different? How are you, what are you doing about technologies? Sometimes they don't want to ask that question, quite frankly, because then that means they've got to actually, you know, maybe respond. That becomes an issue. But what I want to do today is introduce you sort of a back to basics. These are the tools that currently are being used in a variety of venues, a variety of health departments. Remind you that um, they may not all work for everybody, but it's really to jumpstart your thinking. We, we're going to be coming back. Uh, we're going to be thinking about another presentation, sort of an office hours follow up that'll look at le the legal aspects, what happens with HIPAA and the legal. And then we're also going to come back and do a little bit more for, for those of you who are really you know, on this train. How do you develop the policies, the procedures, the cover your butt rules? And then I do TA. So uh, I can work with the state level. I can work with the individual county level. Uh, so we, you know, literally you get me on speed dial. So feel free to ask questions. There's really no dumb questions. Uh, Julie uh, is going to jump in. I hope as, as experience brings different perspectives and then, you know, please feel free to put questions forward that we can ask. And then you can always reach me moving forward after that. So the big thing that's changed, I think, in the last year and a half, you know, first of all, the United States uh, at most health department and federal levels, we've been behind the technology curve. There, you know, e-health has been something other countries have done much further. But I think COVID, uh, in its genesis, pushed us to do better. Yes, we have individual organizations, Kaiser programs like that, who really pushed in the U.S. e-health. But what I do know is that COVID and then MPOX really pushed us to consider. How do we bring this into the STD, HIV, STI arena? But there's been some shifts in the last year. First of all, technology has continued to grow. So one of the things you're going to hear, and I think I've caught them all in this, this version, I'm moving away from this concept of internet partner services. That's what we used to call it. As a matter of fact, we're getting ready to redo the website uh, that um, we'll post in the chat box, our, our toolkit. We have an actual toolkit that you can beg, borrow, steal, anything you want on. Um, but we're moving to this scope of the context that's of digital because the digital platform is what we're pitching because it changes. This is also a great way to reframe how you're doing texting. If you're if you're you know, some folks have done texting, but never really wrote their policy for this, even email. I mean, it falls into the whole digital arena and it also allows for room what's going to happen in the future. For those of you who've been around a minute, one of the things to keep in mind, if your your brain is struggling to see the internet as a way to reach patients, you know, oftentimes I hear, well, they're hard to reach. Well, not really, they're hard to us to reach. The first thing I always tell a group, whether it be supervisors or DIS, is stop thinking it as a thing that isn't touchable and start thinking it as a venue. There are, we have, multiple venues. This is just another venue, like going to the bar, like going to Lover's Lane. So that's a big shift, is, is giving this idea of it's a tangible venue that helps our thinking, because, you know, we're, we're very route the way we think in our work. There will be limitations. It's not going to be a fix for everybody. There are going to be constraints. There will be challenges, depending on your local, uh, your local constraints, your leadership, your IT. But really, the big piece of this, and what I'm hoping pe people do as we move forward, is really start the thinking, start assessing, do do a SWOT analysis, do conversations. Who's who's going to buy in? What do your community people think? Remember, this is part of the skill set that DIS does. This is not going to replace old school partners and partner notification partner services. This is part of that toolbox. 
So why do we want to even be doing this? Well, first of all, it, there's an ethical responsibility for us to use whatever is available to reach people where they are. And we know for many years, especially with um, uh, gay, bi, and uh, non-binary men, they are using social networking applications as a social medium. This is going back 19 years, with, you know, with the early advent of Match.com and, and Craigslist and AOL. It hasn't changed. In fact, technology driven by the adult erotic industry has actually shaped commercial. Uh, um, we would not have where we are with DVDs and, and streaming today had not two things happened in the 70s. One, Jane Fonda released her, her workout video with a VHS, and that moved the, 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 the VHS machines into you know, being a very high elite professional training tool into every home in America. And secondly, the adult industry started to figure out, oh, if we start putting these tapes and making them available, we don't we can make money that uh, that moved us into DVD technology and then streaming. So sex has shaped this sex, sexuality, pleasure. All of this has really shaped us and it continues. It, the Even if you don't get full leadership buy in understanding where you can use the digital landscape as the, uh, an information gathering resource. How do you use, you know, Facebook as the consummate yellow pages? Because ultimately we're going to run into places where we don't have any contact information but a profile name, but we can still do a little bit of work. And if this becomes, you know, we make a phone call, we do a visit, we send a letter for a little bit, you know, not a lot of extra money, maybe a, perhaps just a few extra bits of time, it becomes a cost effective or uh, uh, outreach fourth arm to try and reach that patient that you're trying to reach. I have a lot of slides. Some I'm not going to go word by word. They're there to give you sort of an idea. This sort of set reminds us. All right, you should already be collecting this when you meet with your your clients or your patients, depending on what you're calling them. You want to find out, but it's a, you have to reframe their questions when you start saying, "Hey, where'd you meet your sex partners in the last 21 days or last seven days?" Then you sometimes they tell you this, that, and then you're gonna say, so let's let me backtrack. How many of those did you meet through the use of social networking applications versus a bar? That helps them shift because that's a different way of thinking. And I, I always tell folks when they say, my the guys don't remember, they tell me they don't remember. Well, the reality is the concept of casual partnering, casual engagements is a, a frontal lobe memory. It's like if I asked you what movie did you stream on Netflix last Friday? There's a 60% chance you're gonna be like, I don't know, for the last two years, I've been streaming every single episode of Vera and you know, Netflix mystery there is. I can't remember what we watched anymore. That's actually how it could be. And while that may not necessarily be your norm, it is likely for uh, active users, they just, it was pleasurable, it got what they need and they moved on. So that our skill is how do we revisit them on those sites and help them trigger who it was, whether we go into help them look at their mailboxes or their messages and move forward. So this becomes a great process. It helps the interview skill set, but we still have to remember, are we asking the specific question about the uh, technology and digital platforms? And are we writing that down in searchable fields like profile names? And are we double checking? You know. Men for men, M-E-N, number four, M-E-N, is not the same as men, F-O-R, M-E-N. So we have to be very clear and very intentional when it comes to how we get spellings done. But then the question is, should we do this? Well, it depends. You do need a protocol. You need an operational plan. Now, the protocol is an overarching document. It sort of sets the guidelines, and this is what you would share with your seniors, you know, your senior leadership, your maybe your health commission locally, your IT, your legal. They need to know what you're doing. Do you need to make it so detailed, so illicit? You know, they don't need to see pictures. They don't even need to know the names of the websites. They just need to know you want to use emerging technologies. The protocol or the operational procedures, they do not need to be in that document. Those are a separate document because remember, if we often change operational procedures, if you change them, then you have to revise your protocol. So we want to make sure that they're distinct, but you do need them. In fact, we have on our toolkit uh, versions that you can actually use as starting places. I can share examples as well. 
I say this every time I talk about it, and I have to. I usually say it three times in an hour. This tool, digital partner services, does not replace traditional partner services. It enhances it. So for places that are very wide geographically, it's a great way that you're not going to send somebody a three-hour ride to do a partner service visit. But this could be a way you could then elicit tools by using e-health uh, or other conversations to bring them in. The other part of this, we know that we do not use this as a form of disclosure. We don't give somebody a status. This approach is a concierge. It's basically saying, hey, hi. I, my profile, as you read, is I'm a health person. You, I want to let you know we have a condition you may have been exposed to. I'd love to have a phone call with you. If you are available, could you call me at or may I call you? Can I have your phone number? You want to collect the data because ultimately there's two things. One, you want to talk to the person, motivate them to seek service, and you want to collect their phone number and you want them to come into the clinic. You will, and, and, and that's a challenge because there will be people who will be like, no, 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 give me, tell me what the problem was. I, you can't, that's, you know, every state's got a different rule. Very few states will actually let you do. The only time I know of, and I've had a few of these phone calls about disclosing this way is when it's um, somebody who may have been visiting, lives out of the country, especially around HIV, then it might have to be that way. But we always... The precursor is where this is a motivation technique to move somebody to call you or email you so that you have a, a, to get, and then to get them physically somewhere, whether it be to go to their doctor and get their tests or get treated or to come to your clinic. You also have to look at your data prior to doing this. What are you collecting? If you've not collected or asked anybody, are you meeting partners online or through the, the tech venues? You might need to do that for three or four months first and get a, get a feel, which is the population. If all of your clients are mentioning one particular website that doesn't have a searchable profile, that changes the approach that you might use versus other uh, types of tools where you can search by the name. And then, of course, who's going to be your supporters? Where are those challenges going to be and how do you frame it? We have been talking, we've been working on this for a significant number of years, and, and almost everybody, when we survey DIS, say the same thing. Lack of access, there's issues around firewalls, and some organizations don't provide um, cell phones or tablets, so that is a, a piece of the technology that programs would want to make sure. Now, it doesn't mean everybody has to have one. It could be a shared mobile device. Um, the enhanced navigation and it, when somebody reaches out for me to do a TA with an individual county, we actually walk through that. I'm gonna give you a sample of that. But also how do we make sure and address confidentiality and privacy? And we have another, um, one of my two of my colleagues from the CDC have agreed to come back um, and uh, do that for you. What are the challenges? Well, yes, patients forget. They may give the wrong information. They may just say no. That's no different than the regular partner service activities, really. The idea is if we ask the questions in the right way, we make sure that we match our descriptions um, and, and we encourage them that say, hey, look, we know it's, it's a tool that you all use. But one of the things, and this is a thing that I always say, what's even more important when you're using these tools, it's, it's kind of if you envision a pool, all right? If, you're, if you have a pool and you have the ocean, you have one shark in a pool, the likelihood that you're going to get bit by the shark is much greater than if you have one shark in the ocean because it's a smaller group of a smaller area. Well, that happens if you're all in a, a network application and people are, are kind of fishing around based on preferences, likes, and, and, and geographics, the likelihood that you could be exposed to something is greater than if you go to a dance because of, it's a wider network of people there's more distractions. So it really becomes an important uh, uh, consideration on how we look at this. Yes, you, your account may get kicked off to shake it off and move on. You wait 24 hours and you're restarted. The social applications do not allow us to do this, in quote, legally. Their terms of service don't allow this. They're legal experts who have just said we can't allow you because they would allow other issues to happen. But the owners of the primary digital platforms that we have met with and myself, whether or the uh, building healthy online communities, they have said, we know what you're doing unless a client complains that you've offended them or they don't 
then we shut your account down and you just wait a day and put it back up. We have worked closer and closer, but they're not ready. Their legal experts are not ready because they are legally operating businesses. So we don't have the, the power to mandate that they give us special access. So we do know that these interactions are varied. You have to be careful. What you do in your county does affect what other people do in their county. It also, a matter of fact, if you have a, if, if a DIS who's using these tools has a really negative um, reaction with people, the owners will play that out to all DIS. It affects all across the country because they don't realize we're all separate. You know, to them, we're just this big nebulous team in some cases. So we really, really want to be careful on how we approach, that we're graceful, we're humble, that we leave an open door every time. You need to do your homework. You have to, you know, when, you, when you've decided who you're going to focus on, where you're going to focus on, you have to make sure you've gone to their websites. Almost every social application has a general website that has tools and tips. You can't log in for, for your the login purposes for some of them. There are some, but most of them, but they will have what the, what the terms are, what the, the website is. Some of them even have codes for the icons. It's a social buffet, all right? People will have multiple names. My, I have one caveat that I tell folks all the time. If you came to me and you said, hi, yes, I played with this person. This was their profile name. And the profile name is couple for fun, as in C-O-U-P-L-E for fun. Then I would stop. I would say, great. I would write it down, but I'd stop the conversation right there. Because when it's a web, when it's an account that is coupled, you never know which person in the group on the in the relationship is on that account. That would no longer be a, an appropriate uh, secure conversation because you don't know who that person was talking to and who if they're both checking it. So couple accounts are are the are the bane of my existence. I have to say, and understanding that anonymous is never truly anonymous. You'd be surprised how many people created an anonymous. A Facebook or Gmail account, yet they put their names in somewhere and they don't realize when they send you a message, it says in parentheses their name. We have a lot of opportunities here. We can find that a um, lot of clues within the apps. I'm loving the fact that um, a lot of the social uh, social places like Grindr, Scruff, now allow you to link your Facebook, your Instagram, your Twitter accounts. They give you an open field so people are putting TikToks. This means they become even more ways. So even if you only got permission to use Facebook as an investigatory tool and not communicate through it, it's filling in all the blanks. People are going to say, I'm going to this party tomorrow night. Well, then if you need to do an in-person visit, you know how to do that. And don't forget, I'm going to highlight some of these, but you still have Google Maps, Facebook, Waze. Um, uh, the, the travel and Uber and the, um, the map are, are great because when somebody says, well, I Ubered over there, well, let's look at the history. Did you know that Uber and or your if you drive your GPS, they actually have your history if you scroll down and maybe you can find the address of where you went. Um, so digital venues are not all the same. We have some that only operate on the smart device. We have some that are only going to operate on the browser, but you can get to them through your smart, smart device. And then you have some that are hybrids. So uh, Adam for Adam is a hybrid. You can log on directly online or you can log on through the, um, the phone itself when you download the app. A browser only means it's one that it doesn't have an app, even though it'll show you how to create a little icon on your phone. It's still using your browser. And a smart device one is an app based one through Apple or Android. But it, uh, there's nothing on its main website that you can log into. Hence why you would still need a smart device because if you to be able to utilize those. So understanding those differences and what your needs are will become will become important. We're looking at we want to think do these. You know we're looking at trying to increase who we notify, how many new infections are found, how many people we can motivate to get follow up testing to get treated, how many people maybe they come in for syphilis who've never had an HIV test recently. We can look for. Um, other conditions as well that people may not be aware of. So there are lots of opportunities as well as re-engagement by using this tool. You know, I talk a lot about ST, STDs and STIs, but this works for tuberculosis. It could work for hepatitis. It, could, it worked for COVID. We used it. 
Um, we, we even used it for MPOX in some cases. All right, let's talk about the, the, the history of this. There are some challenges for our DIS when we're doing this. You may have, you're going, it, you know, it's one thing to sit in our office and have an uncomfortable conversation with a client around behaviors. But when you're going into the, a venue like this, where the images are very explicit, uh, you know, each one of these profiles are essentially an advertisement of pleasure. You have to understand where your worldview is, where your boundaries are, what's uncomfortable. So, and having those clear discussions with your supervisors is important. Uh, we do say, and I like to say this, the online tools, the online social network hooks up. It's not just an, um, a male thing. Women have every opportunity. Trans folks have every opportunity. Youth. We just have not seen the significant um, clustering around um, STDs transmission through those same things. And I, I'm okay with that in the moment. You know, there's been very few cases where we've seen heterosexual transmission through a cluster on Match.com, for instance. There's been one, but it was, and it wasn't on match. It was another one. Understanding an ever-changing terminology and jargon is important. And then just, you know, there's going to be a moment that we come in as the health department. So when you create your profile, you never, you never fish. You, you know, I am, uh, we're the health program out of here. Our team is, is designed to help support our community. Some, some programs go very wide. Some people are a little bit more specific because they want to talk about their sexual health clinic. Either way is good. But one of the things that that does mean we have to look at all of the settings because you want to make sure that nobody can track where you, whose profiles you're looking at. If that you're an STD clinic and people can see who you're looking at, that's a problem because it could imply that you think that they're, you know, a problem. Um, I mean, just want to spend a few quick minutes. This is not brand new. People have been sex seeking for hundreds of years. Uh, Rachel and I are, are history buffs. So if you don't recognize these images, these are actually Pompeii. And in during the first century, and before Pompeii erupted, they actually, people didn't read. So they would have on the stones pictures of body parts that you would follow that would bring you to the pleasure home, pleasure palaces or the bathhouses. Um, and then when you got in there, the two photos on the right, that's actually from a recent uh, Pompeii exhibit that traveled that I got a chance to see. They would, you would just walk in and you would point to the pictures of what you were looking for, who you were looking for, and they would connect. So sex seeking is not new. What is interesting that the second picture from the left, that used to be called the lov lovers, that is actually two men. For many, many years, the assumption is it was a, a young man and a young woman. And recently, through the ability to do better x-ray, it's two men. We don't know their story. Could it be a father's son? Could it be siblings? Could it be lovers? We don't know. But it, this is just to give you this idea that this is not culturally new. We just see it more often. But tools have existed. Venues have existed for, for hundreds of years. Where there is a will, there is a way. Remember I talked earlier, we have different types of venues. Well, I've broken them down into three venues. Public venues, these mean anybody can go. There's no sign up, there's no membership. They may be marginally legal. Um, they, they may not be the places that you can advertise. Like, I, I, you know, I wouldn't wanna be in a community meeting say, hey, we know men are hooking up at this library or at this major department store bathroom. Everybody knows it, but it might not be something that is something to do because it actually then becomes a health issue with the police. So those are public venues. They're challenging, but they're accessible. I always say if you're, you're, you have a cluster that you're trying to reach in public venues, if it's a venue that you can reach out to the city or the, the owner's um, security, make sure your health department goes in with your badge a week or three earlier and say, hey, we've got some health people that are going to come in, handle, we need to do observing, we need you to not interfere. Let them know. I did that with the police years ago um, in Marin. We would do public park outreach. And we went and we took the police uh, civilian training. It was like a six week, once a week training that they did with community organizations. Because now when they saw my car in the parking lot, uh, my colleague and I, they drove. They never stopped because they knew we were doing outreach. And they, they understood the need for us to do what we're doing, but not associate with the, the police coming through. What they did when we weren't there, we didn't, that was not my problem. But I wanted to make sure people saw us as an asset. The second type are professional venues. These are the venues that um, you would usually pay to get into. They're, they have rules. Oftentimes, this is where the people will be sharing what are the safer sex guidelines. 
um, there's a, an exchange of money. Now, this is not the same as a brothel or a bordello, okay? You're not paying to have sex with somebody who's being paid to do this. You're, you're attending these spaces to, everybody's paying an admission to have sex with somebody else that paid admission. That's a very di different distinction. Um, and there are different kinds, and it depends on what your legal structure is. Some, some like San Francisco, uh, post AIDS did not have bathhouses. We had them. We had one on each side of the bay, but we had sex clubs. And the distinction used to be if you had four sides of a wall, like a, a small cabinet, um, that would be a bath. That would be considered a bathhouse versus a sex club. But then there are bookstores. There are private parties. These are all of these different approaches. These actually are uh, a DIS's tool. If you are become friendly with the owners, they know they know you want to bring signs in, bring them condoms. Um, they know if you have a cluster, if you're you know really interactive with them, they're the ones that are going to be your your partners really significantly, because they actually have a business and they they make money this way if, by having a good business. Whoops, sorry. The third venue is really what we're I'm introducing today and bringing up and reminding you is the technology venue, the digital venue. And I, I spoke earlier, there are three styles in this venue. There's the web-based, smart device, and the hybrid. So again, I'm, I'm saying this again because I want to bring it home that it's a venue just like any other venue. As a matter of fact, when you write protocols, you could say we're looking at digital venue outreach. That's all you've got to say. You have to say the more extreme names that are going to trigger somebody's reaction. So why is it appealing? Why do why do uh, folks who we find show up in our clinics uh, are feel these are attractive? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Culturally, there's a the structural piece. It's it, it's convenient, you know, uh, for for gay, bi, and non-binary people. Um, the idea of sex outside of marriage doesn't have a construct to it. So there's this con this convenience section. You can be online and you can, you can have multiple partners. If you have a day off, you can be working. You can, you know, it, we're busy people. We also saw as computers got cheaper and smoke, smart devices got smarter, it became a much easier way and compelling way to do this. We actually see that the more people use these, the less they spend time in the bars. Two years of COVID didn't help matters on using technology. But it also, it's a way to help people reduce feelings of isolation. Maybe you're not fully out. It could be um, that you, especially early on, if you were HIV positive, it was a way to, to create niches and go to a positive men's only group um, to explore. These, these profiles are basically your opportunity to, to be uh, your own marketing agent. So it's not unusual for people to be on multiple sites and have different profiles. Maybe one's for dating, one's they want to be a top, one they're a bottom, could be. So the challenge is just as soon as you learn this, the apps change, make changes. Um, and they, the one that made all of the people crazy, and, and I have data people around the country who are still mad at me, they got everything running. And then uh, the leading apps that people talk about allowed, so it used to be you had to put a name. It had to be just alphabets. And all of a sudden they said, oh, no, now you can use emojis or emoticons, or you could use symbols, or you could use dot, dot, dot. So now all of a sudden the data people had to figure out a way, how do you put that in the data fields? So, you know, you, you have to stay up. You have to be paying attention to the changes that come out. You can't, you know, there are VIP services that, um, w that give you extra, extra tools, but by the same token, they also may not be worth it paying if you just go in, do your thing. Um, there's a couple of things to be, you know, like, for instance, if I were doing work, if I was, if Adele and I, you know, I reach out to Adele and we're having a, a messaging back and forth and I want, and I want to send the website that our clinic operates from, I can do that. I can send one link, but if you send more than one link, what ends up happening is you start getting, um, analytics start pulling. And if you send more than two, they might actually turn your account off because they think they're getting hacked. So you have to be judicious on what links you share. What I always tell folks to do is either get something like a, a link tree or a beacons, which is a super easy mobile um, link in bio type of tool. And you can send one link. And on that tool, you can have multiple things like where to get monkeypox test, MPOX tested, where to get syphilis testing. And it's you can uh, change it on the fly. 
Um, if you, any of you who have those dot cards, it's the same effect. It's basically a, like a super adaptable web page that doesn't need a lot of uh, technology. Um, this is, let's see, so we talked about that one. So this is just a reminder. We went from the old phone ads and set newspapers all the way up to mobile apps. We just keep rethinking how this is going to do it. And I, I mentioned again, it's not just a mail thing. A lot of apps, there's over 12,000 social networking apps that are specifically geared toward uh, dating, in quotes, however that it's defined. But we've been um, lucky or unlucky, depending how you look at it, that it's really focused when it, when it comes to rates of syphilis with um, uh, men who have sex with men. This is just another way to look at it. Uh, and I put this because some people like this version of the graph. Equipment costs went down, email became much more adaptable, more, more anonymous. New apps that were more niche became developed and we were able to deploy this on multiple platforms. So this, there was a natural, it made sense. You know, it's like going to a restaurant you like that eventually decides to franchise. All right, uh, right. Well, so I've got mm, about 50, about 10 minutes left. Is that where my time is Adele? Julie, I wanna make sure we're good. We have about 10 more minutes. Yeah, we only have a couple questions coming in. So if you go for 15, that's okay. And then I think Julie's just going to help us out by answering some questions too. So perfect. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time this. I wanted to give people who've never been on any of these apps sort of uh, a, a, kind of a, a glimpse. Sorry, my, I'm, I'm flipping pages on my side uh, that I make sure. So, you know, every, whether it doesn't matter which of these social apps you use, they almost all have the same features. There's going to be an advertisement of, People write about themselves, how they market themselves. They're going to be a photo. There's going to be a, a tool that allows you to chat back and forth. Now, this isn't an email. This is an internal chat messaging. You can't email frank at scruff.com. That doesn't work. It's an internal message. It'll also give you, and this is important for DIS, it gives you some stats. You know, it's going to give you age, weight, height, race. Yeah. Kind of like a driver's license. You have to take that with a grain of salt. You know, it's like, in fact, somebody said to me on um, one of these the other day, oh, do you have to go through because it's your birthday and, and change your, your age now everywhere? I'm like, no, because it asks you the date of your birth and it automatically does it for you. On, on, and that's actually everywhere. You'll know it because when you hit 55, all of a sudden ARP knows that you're around and they start sending you things. We chat, as I said, remember, do not expect a great Amer American memoir, okay? Chats can be as simple or as basic as, are you lucky? What do you like? This is what I like. Good. What time? When and where? Boom. Then there are other who chat back and forth. It's become a social thing, and then they make arrangements. So you have to be prepared that it may not be an elaborate conversation, and remember that it may not be all alpha characters. So understanding how you make notes of that. I talked about um, the social integration. So this is uh, Grinder, one version. They have incredible resources that you can read about. What I think is interesting, and, and I tell any health department that's going to do online um, work with the digital platforms, is to, if they have Facebook, follow the, the platforms and, you know, follow them on Facebook. It makes total sense because they, they put messages out. But here um, on the right is an example of one of the apps that it allows you to actually put your personal links on there. Well, I don't have to use that tool. If I log in and I can get to that tool on somebody, I might be able to find exactly what I want. So this is where it's the investigation side of this comes into play. As I mentioned earlier, don't underestimate your companion apps, ride shares, navigation, social apps like TikTok, Snapchat. Snapchat's growing. People are using it because it's a bridge as they as uh, for adult content where they're not sure what's going to happen with, um, you know, Twitter X um, and, and um, Instagram. So Threads is the newest version. So, you know, just you have to have somebody aware, paying attention, uh, understanding how those tools work so that you know what to find. I didn't used to have this slide, but I'm going to take this is a commercial. This is a commercial for you. GPS, Global Positioning System. If you look at right now where you're sitting, you are the center of your world, wherever your phone is, okay? So that means when the global positioning system, when you're on, logged in an app, it's gonna look above you, below you, 
So your left to your right, front and back. 10 feet, 20 feet, 500 feet, 2,000 feet. That's how this works. So if an app doesn't allow you to search by profile name, it, it doesn't make sense for you to even consider that app. What your, your shift is talking to your, your patients to say, so you use Grindr. All right. So why don't we open up, why don't you open up your Grindr, especially if they're there with you in person, and let's see if you can find the person's profile in your message queue. And then let me text you some examples of script that you can text them that says, hey, look, I was at the clinic. I went in for my annual, my, my six-month or my three-month checkup. I got treated for, because remember, a patient can tell another patient whatever they want, what they have. And I did have to get treated for gonorrhea. But the, the, the health specialist here has given me a phone number and a name that says, if you call them, they will fast track you in for treatment. Just that phrase alone will, is, is um, encouraging because fast track means I don't have to wait for my doctor. But also means sometimes when you reach out to a patient, they're already going to the, they're going to go to the doctor, but they don't feel an obligation that they need to follow up with the health department that they've actually done it. And that's, you know, that's why we want to give them options, give lots of opportunities, leave the doors open. And then you'll say, why don't you think about it? I'm going to text you all of these scripts. I'll give you a call in two days. As long as two days, you know, as long as it's a week, but you never approach anybody using these tools on a Friday because what happens is they don't log in until 505 Friday, you've gone home and then they're mad all weekend. So you really have to strategically look at when you're approaching people through these sites. Some sites have extra features. They um, have, uh, you pay a little extra, they give you some different tools. Uh, there are pluses and minuses, but you, you know, you can be aware of that. Almost all of them have a term of service online that you can access that we recommend you really having a good feel for. You can also, if your programs have money, you can, you can create geocoded pop-up messages. Um, we work with several different organizations. BHOC has references, um, but also a group called Commando, and they create really great ads that will pop up on Grindr, and you can customize it by area code or zip code and it'll show up to people once a day or every other other day. And it, then it directs them to a landing page for a call to action. It's another way of utilizing these tools with especially um, funds if you have it. Let's see what else. So these are just how, this is what these look like. You're gonna be able to see when you log in where your messages are, um, what the, you, some, some of them will give you the first sentence or two, um, but they're all the same, okay? There's gonna be your picture, you're gonna have photos, you've got settings. Who, you can tell who viewed you unless you turn that off. Uh, and then this is the big one, favorites. That's the one as a DIS. I'm always reminding people, did you favorite them? Did you really like them? Let's go look at your favorites list because it's a quick way to find out who, what the settings are. Understanding all your settings is really important. How when you're creating your account, you know, it's going to ask you for some information. So I always say default to the population most at risk when you're trying to do your demographics. So if you're a, a, a female identified DIS, but you're working primarily with gay men, put gender as male because you, it requires you to make a choice, but you're not pretending to be a person. You're, you're talking about your agency or your organization or your, your, so you, you know, when in doubt, go to the null. So, you know, if, that, if it mandates you have to put an age in, put 99, you know, go, go extreme. Um, this is just an example of Grinder. If you notice, Grinder, Scroft, they were very similar. They all change a minute after I do these slides. They roll out brand new ones, so I just stopped updating them. But they all have this same element. Perfect. Um, talked about that. Am I going the wrong direction again? Yeah, so this is all of what I wanted to really make sure that you were covered. Now, um, there are a couple of things you can do, uh, technical assistance. You can contact me. We walk through this. Um, I, I, Adele, I think you were going to do it. We On our web page, on our toolkit, which is basically all of the information that you can um, share, there's a bunch of things you can do to learn more. You can uh, follow our, um, we have a, a listserv you can join that gets us our, our calls about every three or four, once, uh, four times a year we do these with um, NCSD, and we have sometimes we have owners of the apps come in. They're really, we have our next one next month. 
Uh, you can also complete our WebSim tool. The WebSim tool is a really quick and easy practice session. It does a nice introduction if you've never done work on these apps before without having to log in. Um, Facebook definitely is a tool. Many people are using it as an unofficial search engine, but there is an architecture. When you create a Facebook account, you have to be very careful. It used to be you could just say uh, City Clinic as the account holder. Now you actually need to have a main account holder with a name and an email address. So what the approach I actually tell people is in your program, you choose a senior leader, that becomes a major, a, a main account, you give them their real first name, you use a, an online email for that, and then you lock that account down so nobody can search for it, and then you create a page for partner services, for navigation, for whatever else, and then you operate from that page moving forward. Um, that's a, that you, you then become very uh, terms of service friendly around, you know, logging into Facebook. Nice thing about once you do that, then you can download Facebook Messenger, sign in, and you can use that anywhere. Um, this is our website, our toolkit, as I mentioned. We'll get ready in January to update it, but there's bunches of resources here that you can make use of. You have me, as you like, to help and support. We also have some dear colleague letters. If you're, you know, you're thinking that there'll be some challenges, we have a, a paper we published in 2017-18. Um, we're getting ready to get another dear colleague out. And basically that's from the CDC that says, we really appreciate. And I wanna remind people, so, uh, healthypeople.gov has been, you know, it started off with one line in technology around Healthy People 10. And now as we're moving into Healthy People 30, it's paragraphs of how technology is an asset. Uh, this is our listserv, that, it, just to give you a heads up for, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. This is the web sim. It takes less than 20 minutes. You can do it on your phone. You can do it on a computer. But it's really quick and simple to let you see what it's like to walk through the steps. Right down to two minutes over. <laughs> All right. That's perfect. Thank you, Frank. And I did pop those links that um, that he described into the chat. And so if it's okay with everybody, we do have a couple of questions I would love to um, to push to you guys. I think. So the first one is, Frank, you mentioned a second tool that's like Linktree that you could use. What was the name of that second tool? Beacons IO. So it's B-E-A-C-O-N-S dot I-O, I think. It's it's identical to Linktree. Um, okay. But it, or, uh, and they, they have a free version. But I, I'm a big fan of both. I've used both. Okay. Beacons dot I-O. Okay. I just typed that into the answered questions. Um, we have a couple more. So if you were to create an account on these apps, do you use information of your organization on these apps? Like, for example, um, Winnebago County Health, or do you get accounts like that are, someone says like, would a generic name like get tested be better? What would you recommend? As long as you're not representing that you're a person instead of an agency. It, you know, it could, uh, the one thing I think like a get tested because you're doing partner services, get tested maybe a little too skewed. People that don't need to test or already test may ignore you. But I think uh, Win Health could work, um, you know, local health, whatever it might be. But, you know, keep it synonymous to how you're known so that if they click on a link, they, they say, okay, this is the same group of people. Okay. But don't put like Jane Smith or anything. Don't represent yeah, yourself. I, I wouldn't represent yourself. I would represent um, the agency. Okay. And I actually, I I will I I recommend in the profile under the the, the gen, generic description say we're a team of health sexually health sexual health specialists who who monitor this account. So you never have to say who you are except when you message, and then um, because multiple people may be using the same login for that account. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Um, another good question. So since chats may have very personal info, like what types of sex or kinks a person might be into, um, when would it be appropriate if ever to ask a person to see their chat or have, or to go through a chat with a client? Well, I, I think it depends on what your goal is. Uh, uh, you know, if, if the goal is to see if you can communicate with the person, then the, the reality is, so if you're sitting there with a patient, you don't need to know what their chat is. You just need to know they still have the chat so that you can confirm what the date was, uh, what the, the profile name was, and then say, can you scroll through? Do you have an address in there or a telephone number? 
And if if none of those work, then it might be so here, let me text you the script so you could and then you could watch them cut and paste it in and send the message. Um, I think you you have to you know, you have to sort of give them a bit of distance because they do have some of that history in there. So it depends on what you're aimed for. OK, that makes There'll sense. be some people who will like, here is my phone. Scroll, do what you want. Other people will be like, well, and, and I think that's where experience trying to figure out where you want to go. Got you. Um, and then this one more question, or actually a couple more. Is it possible that people use favorites to document document anyone they may have had an encounter with? They don't necessarily use it to document. The likelihood that people use favorites are going to be either people they've had encounters with and they have enjoyed, or it's somebody that they're they're courting to become mm -hmm. and they want to make sure they know when they're on or they want to quickly access them in case they're not online at the moment. So, you know, it's sort of like your favorites on your cell phone. The same same idea there. Um, uh, it, it's not I don't think people use it per se as a, um, uh, a a notch on a bedspread, you know, on a bedpost type of mentality. But some people will, you know, will favorite the, the people they either want to see again or uh, are, are queuing up to, to hopefully, you know, make that happen. OK, thank you. Oh, and I'm just seeing a note from someone that says the chat is disabled. I will. Um, put the the links in these question answers then. Thank you for letting us know about that. And someone's asking, will we have access to these slides later? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Frank, this whole webinar is gonna be able to be accessed on our, our website. And then I think it is like kind of a slightly different set of slides that we can that we send out after the fact, is that correct? Yeah, what I try to do is once I get a copy of a lot of the questions, I will often try and make sure I can either figure out is there an answer to these questions in the slide set or I add an answer so that they're all in one um, in, in a one place? And then we'll have a PDF that most likely you'll be able to either uh, put up on the website when people watch it or you can send it out to the registrants. It's up to you, but I'll get that within a week. OK, wonderful. Thank you. Um, let's see. Another question. What about creating accounts just looking but for looking, but not reaching out. So these seem like two different approval process. For example, if you're using accounts just to look for look people up, do you need to be agency identified? Obviously you still don't want to be phishing, but just looking for clarification and any in-between use. I would say if a community knew that you were going onto those websites just to look, you have a HR disaster waiting to happen. If you do not have a protocol around why you're looking, if you're if you get the permission to look, it should be tacked on to utilizing an action. Now, Facebook, I think, is the is the different. You could a lot of people will use Facebook as a viewing tool, not a contacting tool. But when you start getting into terms of service and memberships, um, just as a looky loo, uh, people can tell they can see who's looking. If all of a sudden I see a health department's looking at my profile and they don't ask me a question, I might get mad and I might get weird about that thinking it's anything and I could complain. So there's, it, you know, if, you, if you've if you got the pro profile and the, your patient is saying, I met my partners on Scruff and you're searching on Scruff, you should have the permission to go to the next step and reach out. Just to search does you no good really because you, it, it's, a, it's, it's just a flat. It might confirm what they look like, but the patient could have told you that. If you're sitting there and the patient wants to hold it up to you, that's fine. But I, I would be a little bit more cautious and conservative just logging in. But I don't think you should do any of that until you have something. And if, if your leadership says, yes, you can use these as a, as a sort of a passive uh, outreach tool or a passive review tool, then you still should have a protocol. Who can log in? What's your profile look like? What is the objects? What are the limitations? You still have to have an approved protocol uh, in, in place for that because, it, you, you know, I'm telling you, it's an HR nightmare if something happens. Yeah, I'm sure you've seen it all. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Have. We have a couple more. Um, thank you all for these questions. They're awesome. So what can be done about being blocked by individuals on the apps or having someone report you and your profile if you're deleted by the app developer? Not a thing. There's not a thing. That is the nature of the beast. If you get blocked, you uh, you have to just accept that's a no. That is a patient decline to be 
this could be contacted at that point. You just put it that way in your notes. If you get bounced off the app because patients complain, you wait 24 hours and try to log in again. This is a problem because if you have 15 DIS in one area, in one health department, for instance, and you all create your own account, the, the apps are going to say, why do I have so many accounts coming from the same IP address? And they might cancel them all. So sharing the accounts make, makes sense at that point. But no, there's nothing we can do about it. You just don't have to take it personally. Uh, you know, you're going to get blocked. You're going to get ghosted. Doesn't mean they didn't hear what you had to say. Because immediately when you, you they realize you're coming from the health department about, a, a you know, an STD condition, that you're trying to, or your health information, chances are they were like, oh, I know what this is. So then they'll block you because they're embarrassed, but then they're going to maybe hopefully go take care of it themselves. I mean, there's always that. And I've heard that from some of the clinics saying, yeah, uh, I, somebody reached out to me. It was kind of embarrassing. I, I just blocked it, but I came in anyhow. So okay. don't always assume that they didn't do anything, but there, you don't, not to necessarily take it personally. It's just the mechanism. We're, we're working in a venue. It's like going into a bar and the bar owner saying, it's way too busy. I don't want you doing outreach here today. Got you. Okay. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Next one. I know every app will be different, but in general, if in your experience, if someone says they have deleted the app, is it easy to recover their account? Do most accounts stay active unless specifically deleted rather than just deleting the app off their phone? Um, there are different ways. They can deactivate the app. They can delete the app. They can just take it off the phone. Just because they took it off the phone doesn't mean they deleted their account. Um, and oftentimes that's a that's a, a very common reaction when you get an STD is to delete the app. Some people will delete the app um, uh, because they don't want partners, boyfriends, girlfriends, wives to see the app on their phone. But then when they go out of town, they just download it again and they reactivate it. It's it, it, As long as you haven't deleted the account, it doesn't take much to put it back on and re-log in. But it depends on how what they did. If they just remove the app, that's just you still have an active account. But if they deleted their account, then uh, once it's deleted, I don't think you couldn't reestablish it with everything because you would have lost everything. There. Okay, that makes sense. Um, another good question. Some apps or websites filter out accounts based on prefer preferences. For example, um, a man seeking sex with men account won't be able to see women who are seeking sex with, uh, with women or men. If we're unable to change preferences, do we create another account or does that depend on the agency? That's a good question. Hey, that, I'm sorry, I missed the first part. Say that again. Yeah. So like what they're saying is some websites filter out accounts based on preferences. So if I have an account that's, let's say I'm a man seeking sex with men, I put that as my demographics. I wouldn't be able to see women, for example, because I'm only a man seeking sex with men. Would that then a public health department perhaps want to create multiple accounts you looking could, for different but, demographics? But if you're, but, but that's outreach, that's not partner services. Partner services, you have a profile name that you're looking for. So you don't really, it doesn't really matter what the indicator is because you're, you are only going to use web tools that have a search function by, pro, by, by profile name. So it's a null point. If you're okay. only looking to do generic outreach and you're, you know, that's a different story. But for partner activities, you're actually going in there looking for a particular person based on a profile name. If you have, if you go and I'm looking for all women, 20 to 25 with brown hair and tattoos, you're going to be, because they're not always going to show up in geo range. So that would, that would be a huge waste of time. So if you don't have a profile name on these apps, it doesn't pay for you to be able to search. And if it doesn't allow you to search, it's not going to be a, an, a, a, a tool worth the, the effort. Okay. So the filtering thing may not matter because you need to search by username anyway. Okay. Right. That makes sense. Um, another question, can you also touch on protocol for recreating a profile after your original profile has been deleted by the app developer? Totally simple. Open up a Word document. As you build your profile, copy and paste everything that you put in. What's your profile name? What you indicated? And then you have it so that when you, you have to recreate your profile, you just start a new one. Maybe add a one at the end of the new profile name. And copy and paste the content in super easy. And then you just have that document ready. Uh, that's what I tell everybody, especially if you spend a long time curating your, your blurb, then it's just a copy and paste blurb. Okay, perfect. 
And this is the last question. Oh, a couple more. Um, has anyone reached out to these accounts and asked general questions directly? So for example, like someone has reached out to you asking general questions on HIV. Can we respond to these questions if someone does, or should we limit the use of our accounts for partner notification? If somebody reaches out to you, yes, you can answer. But you should always say, I'm very happy that you asked this question. It's a great question. I have limitations of how I can respond with links. However, the, the answer to your question is yes, uh, you know, oral sex is limited in risk to HIV, especially if, you know, people know their status, blah, blah, blah. That'd be fine. And then say, if you want to know more, visit the website and you, you post your website there or say, if you have other additional questions, give me a call. And, and then or, you know, direct them to whoever does your public outreach. Yes, you can. As long as they approach you, you can definitely answer questions while you're on there. I think it's a passive opportunity to, to build a community vibe. So, yeah, I definitely say do that. OK, great. That's helpful. And that's where Beacons and Linktree is really great, because if you start to see you're getting a lot of questions, um, then you can actually create that. Say, hey, I'm going to send you a link in bio. Click. Um, that's that's question number three. It's the most popular question people ask me. It's already up there and there's our answer. OK, that's awesome. Good to know. Um, what are there? Are there benefits to buying a full subscription versus using the app in general? What do you find with that? Um, it depends on the features like some apps. If you buy the the the, um, the VIP upgrade, it allows you to look at some of your settings a little differently. For instance, you can turn off who's looked at you or people go into stealth mode it also turns off ads so it really depends on understanding the features that you need i'm always looking at when i i don't want anybody to be able to see i'm looking at them until i message them so that's a, a vip feature for some accounts and then it makes sense and most of these it'll be like three or six month uh, purchase plan through the apple store or the android store so you'll have to have you know the payment process set up for but again, if your account gets canceled, you lose that money. So I, I generally say don't buy too too much in advance just in case. Okay, that's smart. Yeah. And then I know we, we're at 402, so I have one more question. If other additional questions come in, I will communicate with Frank. And I know he's good about answering those and people can also reach out to him directly. Last question. So these accounts are only short term, case by case and not meant for anything longer is what the question says. Um, the, the accounts technically are a conduit. It's like making a phone call. It's to encourage this person who your index case said, I had sex during my infectious period with this person. Here's his profile. So this is about reaching out to somebody who may have been exposed and encouraging them to seek treatment, testing, and come in to see you. So now... Does that mean if they have a good experience with you that they don't keep in touch and favorite your profile and occasionally say, um, the discharge, can you get me in the clinic? That happens. That's an actual, that's a plus when that happens. I look at that as a gift. Um, but, uh, you know, they're not meant to be an intervention where you're, you're getting them to do stuff like this is not an intervention based on that. This is, look at this as a commercial. The whole motivating fact is you want them to call or talk or show up. You want to get them off the platform communicating with you to communicate with you so that you can then encourage them and be able to track where they are with an action. Okay, that's super helpful. Um, just to wrap up, I'm showing the screen. HCET has a lot of different virtual learning opportunities. If you go to hcet.org, you can see all of our different um learning opportunities. This one, this webinar will be archived on our website. So look for that there. I can also send out a link uh, to attendees when, when this is available. I think it does take a couple days. And then lastly, I just want to thank you all for, for taking the time. I know this is really cool, really helpful information. Um, and look out in your inbox in the next, next couple of days for our evaluation so you can tell us how we did. Uh, thank you all so much. Let me just look at my notes one more time and make uh, sure I haven't. Oh, go ahead. Adele. Adele, will you put my email in, in the chat as well, fhs3 at cdc.gov, so that folks know how to reach me individually as well? Yes. Hold on. Let me just copy and paste it. And oh, thank, thank you for um, reminding me. I was able to put the the links 
in the chat yeah. now that so that everyone can see them. So hopefully if you if you couldn't see those before, that was my error. Perfect. Here we go. And uh, folks, if you send the TA request to the website, it still comes to me. So either way, it doesn't matter which way you approach it, but you do have access for more. And I, I try to get back to everybody pretty quick. Yeah, it showed up a little weird on different lines. I'm just going to type it again. FHS3 at cdc.gov. So yeah, if you email that, you're getting a hold of Frank Strona. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I hope this was helpful. Thank you all. We'll see you soon. Bye.